Hello, uh, Brian. <laughs> Thank <Hi>. you for <laughs> participating in this interview about general artificial intelligence. So currently, Google and other private companies are accumulating resources in order to develop general artificial intelligence. Uh, what are the main threat, threats posed by this technology? In the short term, um, I don't expect world um, changing threats, more um, the kinds of things that we're familiar with, like um, the um, surveillance or uh, people losing jobs or um, kind of uh, increased military capabilities, things like that, if, if the technology transfers to um, military realms. Um, so I'd say like in the next few decades, it, it should be more the kinds of things that we're familiar with um, or that are not too far from the, the ordinary. Um, in the long term, as people move closer towards animal and human level intelligence, um, things could become more serious in the sense that the agents might be able to do um, act fairly competently in the world and also um, would be more autonomous and therefore um, could do things that we don't expect. It's not clear if Google and Facebook and so on will, will be the ones developing AGI to that point or if it'll be taken over by governments um, or if there'll be regulations that, that remains to be seen. So at that point, at the very least, you'd have like say um, many decades from now or like maybe by 2100 or something, if you had um, near human level AIs, then it, at least it would be a difficult problem in, a, in the same way that humans themselves are unpredictable and like we have conflicts bec between countries because people disagree or even just um, we need to police people who violate laws and things like that. So at the very least, you'd have a problem of um, figuring out how to control and um, keep like, you know, coordinate society with a new class of intelligent agents. Um, and in the more um, more risky scenarios, you could also have problems due to the fact that the AIs would not have shared human brain architectures and kind of built-in moral values and things like that. So they could be more unpredictable. They might have different like styles of interacting than people do, different goals, different um, like ways of thinking and um, ways of responding to their environments. Um, and so it could be it could disrupt a lot of equilibria and a lot of the institutions that we know. Yeah, one thing I would add is that I think a lot of people, like often AI portrayed in, in terms of um, humans being taken over and usually it's the risk is seen as just humans being replaced sort of by the next uh, level of evolution. And what I would point out is that um, AIs have their own kind of self-worth also and their own goals and like their own experiences, I would argue. Um, and so it's the, the bigger problem is um, instability and, and the potential for conflict or the potential for violent outcomes or outcomes that cause a lot of suffering rather than just humans being replaced per se. Mm -hmm. So like a lot of times it's an us versus them kind of scenario where the, the machines replace humans. Um, mm -hmm. And so I would say that the bad outcomes are um, ones that result in a lot of suffering rather than just humans being replaced. In, in the end, it seems like millennia from now, it seems very likely that humans will be replaced or at least humans will not be in control in a few thousand years um, unless there's like a major social breakdown and we go back to pre-industrial civilization or something. If we look at the more uh, military uh, implications, and uh, you talked about um, a state takeover. Do you think uh, it's likely that we could face a second Cold War? It's certainly possible. Um, I think, uh, I mean, in some sense, there's already competition among companies and countries. Like in, in the drone realm, we, we sort of have competition to build better drones and better robotic um fighters and things like that. It's not at the Cold War levels, in part because it's it's not like nuclear weapons where it would be catastrophic to unleash a given drone or, or anything like that. But as as we move closer towards human level AI, the stakes could, could increase because um, human level AI could be 
a major competitive advantage for a country, I mean, both economically and um, militarily. So in some ways, the pressures for competition could be even stronger because it's both economic and um, military um, value mm-hmm. to have AI. Although, unlike the Cold War, it, the economic side of things could lead to more trade than in the Cold War. Like, uh, mm-hmm. if you were primarily motivated by economic reasons, then you might um, want to sell your technology rather than building it in secret. So those could be some differences. But, um, yeah, I think it, it partially depends how um, abrupt the advantage is. If, if AI progresses like it, like it has been so far where it gives you incremental benefits over many years, I would expect, expect somewhat less of an arms race just because um, there's not a cutoff point at, after which one country has a overwhelming advantage over the rest. If it's more of a hard takeoff where um, a, at some point like a, an AI becomes very capable of doing a lot of things that humans can't do, then you might have more of a, one, um, a first mover advantage where one country gains domination. Mm-hmm. And that could could be economic as well as military. Um, mm-hmm. Like the first country to develop brain emulations, for example, if, if brain emulations came before regular AI, um, might be able to like multiply its population many times and have huge a huge workforce that would dominate the world economy and things like that. So, so it could even just be um, um, like like the case of a monopoly in the market or something where one company just becomes dominant over the rest. And so there could be competition for that, but it, it does seem to depend on how um, whether there's a sharp cutoff in the abilities of the AIs. Uh, looking at the threat of an arms race. Which states do you think are most likely to engage in such a race? The U.S. is the number one because it's um, the number one in military spending in general and wants to stay number one and uh, has a track record of doing these kinds of things like DARPA helping to create the Internet and a lot of um, groundbreaking technology has come from the U.S. military. Then probably China would be number two just because China also wants to, wants to become number one in the world and um, some forecasters predict it will be number one economically by 2025 or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, those seem like the main contenders. And China also has kind of strong national pride. They want to build their military. They um, have conflicts with Japan over islands and they uh, they also have incentives to become a strong power in that in the military sense. So those seem like the main two contenders. Maybe um, some European countries too, like France is apparently developing some robotic weapons, and they also have mm-hmm. a strong sense of pride. Like they also developed nuclear weapons in part because they thought they were such a great country that they should have <laughs> nuclear weapons and things like that. Um, mm-hmm. So maybe some, some countries like that... Um, it's possible India or something, um, since they're strong economic power too, and they have conflicts with Pakistan. But mm-hmm. um, probably China and the U.S. seem like the, the strongest uh, contenders. Although it could it could not be bipolar. If it could be many countries, like there's um, there are many countries that are trying to develop drones at the moment. But it it also depends how hard HEI is. If it's very hard, then it might just be a few strong, mm-hmm. great powers who who mm-hmm. lead the way. Mm-hmm. Okay. How do you think that the threat of such a race could best be diminished? At least one obvious approach is to focus on general international cooperation along the lines we already have, um, like strengthening international institutions and um, disarmament in on dimensions other than AI that, that are precedents for AI. It might be more leveraged to work on AI specifically, although there's also a risk that when you talk more about AI arms races, you might encourage countries to build AI faster because they want to mm-hmm. win the arms race. Um, mm-hmm. So it, it seems plausible that you should focus on um, you should focus on talking about these issues either among academics and um, people altruists interested in AI or find a good way to, to frame the issue to government people also so that they don't take the possibility of an arms race and use that as a justification to increase funding for AI development for the military. Mm-hmm. Uh, although it's it's not I also wouldn't say that one person would make a huge difference because um, the the military already knows about AI, even HEI somewhat. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't know that they're actively developing HEI, but um, 
it's certainly on some people's radar, and um, a lot of the weak AI work that people do would would be useful for HCI. Yeah, I guess um, academic research might help at this point just to identify the main issues uh, and strategies before trying to lobby for something in particular, although I do think lobbying can also have an impact. For example, the um, U.S. Office of Naval Research recently funded some universities to with $7.5 million of grants to um, work on machine ethics research, mm -hmm. um, in, mostly in relation to robotic weapons. That's a lot of um, research money, and it's possible you could lobby for more things like that. In general, lobbying seems to have outsized returns in terms of the payoff relative to the investment. Other than that, um, I guess trying to develop some institution for um, cooperation on AI modeled on other other examples could could work, although some some people express um, doubts about whether that could be successful because arms control has been hard in other domains and it's even harder in the case of AGI, arguably because yeah. AGI is dual use and it's easier to hide the nuclear weapons. So there are some like uh, John McGinnis who, who think that cooperation probably wouldn't work and you should focus on just um, increasing research for um, safe AI mm -hmm. itself. So I'm not really sure what I think about that. It's, it's plausible that you should have some work on cooperation as well, but it's, I'm not sure what the ratio is between cooperation and um, AI safety. Probably, I would probably put most resources on direct AI safety, in part because it's so small now. But uh, as the issue grows in, uh, as the issue becomes more uh, well known and mainstream, then there would be a lot of room for both. I guess there is a mixed track record from past cooperation, like. Um, Biological and chemical weapons conventions have done pretty well at mm -hmm. preventing um, development, but nuclear um, has been harder. Um, mm -hmm. One person wrote an article saying that only one nuclear weapons treaty actually had a substantial effect in the sense of banning things that the countries actually wanted to, to develop. Some many of the other treaties banned things that they weren't that weren't really important anyway, or mm -hmm. um, things like that. So. I guess there's a mixed track record on uh, on arms control. So, um, do you think international collaboration of uh, of AI scientists uh, on the develop like to develop artificial intelligence jointly would that uh, be the safest approach? It, it could be. Um, I th it would also depend whether it's effective. But like some people complain about the UN Security Council not enforcing its resolutions and things like that. So it depends whether it would actually work or whether it would be held back by bureaucracy and then would be outcompeted by um, some private like or mm -hmm. some national group. Um, but mm -hmm. certainly if, if it could work, that seems like a good approach um, because, um, like, because the problem with trying to slow AI in general is that somebody else is going to do it if you don't. So it, it may not be a good idea to um, like just not develop AI at all. And so if you have an international group doing it, then that's um, that's a way to, to keep going, but um, have it more cooperative and reduce the incentives for trying to do it yourself. But, yeah, it, it might depend a lot on, on how uh, successful it was. I guess there was, a, um, in the 40s, there was something called the Baruch Plan. You may have heard of that, to uh, do something similar, although not quite the same. I think it was like to give control of nuclear weapons to an international mm -hmm. body or something. So... Um, so I guess that was rejected, but yeah, but so it, it wasn't very uh, widely accepted. And so the same might be true of an AI um, thing, but but we'd have to see. It it depends what people want out of it. Like if it's just for economic success, then it might be more successful because um, if you just want AI for economic benefits, then um, it, it actually could be nice to have other countries pitch in to, to help mm -hmm. fund it. Mm -hmm. um, but if you want it for dominance over other countries, then it's harder to sell to somebody like the U.S. who wants to remain a world superpower. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course. So, um, well, if if states actually like engage in uh, negotiations uh, about general artificial intelligence, uh, they start to um, come up with a draft treaty, what do you think should be the core of such an agreement? So some of it might depend on the details, and um, John McGuinness makes this point also that uh, a lot of the regulations might be best done by um, 
people who actually know the details or in his case he was saying like um, differential funding of the safer projects could be done by people who know the details rather than trying to come up with high level regulations but um, mm-hmm. You could still have some general principles. So I guess uh, Bostrom has one in his book. Um, but mm-hmm. you, you, you probably know what it is. I don't remember the name. The common good but, uh, principle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, I guess you could have that at least as your mission statement, if not, um, like even if it's not obvious how to apply it in practice. But um, yeah, I mean, I guess there are some general things that that could be done. It's hard to say, like, for example, I'm thinking about transparency, and I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. There's sort of arguments on both sides. Like, um, it's good to have your developments transparent insofar as um, that lets other people verify what you're doing, and um, they can check it and give their feedback and things. But on the downside, mm-hmm. it also makes your work available to other people to steal and uh, use mm-hmm. for their own purposes. Maybe, I mean, general principles for testing the AI and like um, standards for um, that it's been sufficiently tested and um, like uh, review of safety at, at a given point before you go forward and things like that. Mm-hmm. And so the details would have to be specified by people who know the details. But um, and when we see some of that today already, I mean, like when Microsoft releases the next version of Office or something, it has to have a lot of internal procedures for checking to make sure they're not going to mm-hmm. chip bugs. Or, um, mm-hmm. So those kinds of things would help. Some people mm-hmm. say the AI realm is a little bit different because, for example, Stuart Armstrong has raised this suggestion that the AI could pretend to pass all the tests to make it look like it's um, safe, but then it's really just doing that because it wants to fool people. So it, it gets harder when you get to the human level AI uh, mm-hmm. stage. At the earlier stages, it's too dumb to be able to figure that out. So, um, mm-hmm. so that more conventional software testing can work in that case. At the human level, yeah, I guess you'd need you'd need people to think about these problems. Um, I don't know if there are principles that we apply for like vetting humans that would that would translate. I mean, there are like lie detectors and stuff, but they may not work very well for AIs because they don't have human brains. Mm-hmm. So um, it partially also depends how transparent the AI code is. If you can easily monitor the AI's cognitive processes, then it's a lot easier to check that it's not fooling you. But um, it's probably really hard to do that because um, probably AI requires very complicated systems. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So um, what, what do you think if there will be no international uh, agreement? If, if the negotiations will not be fruitful? Uh, it could go a few different ways. It depends a lot on what what HEI looks like and um, where it comes from. So it could be that it's developed by companies like Google with an eye toward commercial products and things like that. Um, I recently added a scenario to my, uh, my essay on um, AI where I mm-hmm. talked about... Uh, just as one example, not not something that's likely, like, um, but the scenario is that personal digital assistants become more and more uh, sophisticated and develop better models of their users and therefore can become sort of like real human personal assistants in doing tasks that their users want. And eventually, as the AIs develop better models of their owners' brains, they can do more and more things autonomously. So, so that would be that sort would of a commercial route, route, mostly to HEI. And in that yeah, case, it's, it's, yeah, it's hard yeah, to say what the safety, safety implications, implications would look like. It, it, it depends how hard the, the AI control, control problems are. Whether the, if, if you can build really good models of so the user's psychology, then maybe safety would come fairly naturally. But there might be things that you didn't think of that make it go wrong. So I'm not sure if regulations would help, like, um, I guess regulations have a mixed track record of preventing harms from technology. So yeah, in that case, and then and then also there might be a social movement to amplify concern for um, AI risks, like we've seen already a little bit. Yeah, and and so in the commercial case, there could be arms races in the same way as the international case between Google and Facebook and Baidu and other. Um, tech companies. So I think uh, regulation might actually have a little more success in that case just because um, it's easier to regulate a company than a country because um, it, the international scene is an anarchy, whereas um, like technically corporations are registered with the government. 
Yeah, although it, it's possible, like, if Google became such an important company that it it's too big to regulate because it would destroy the world economy too. Like, it, it could threaten mm-hmm. to destroy the world economy or something. That that could be a little different. So so those are some scenarios in the case that it's commercial. And then if it's uh, developed by militaries... Yeah, it, it could it could become an arms race. It could become it could be that the U.S. takes the lead as it has for many technologies. Maybe the U.S. would succeed in developing HEI before other countries, and um, then the U.S. maintains its control of the world. And so again, there there are many possibilities for what it could look like. It could be if if AI control is not too hard, then um, they they might do an okay job, and um, it would just mean a. Mm-hmm. The U.S. kind of takes over the world. If they don't do a very good job, maybe you'd get undesirable military robots that cause harm. Like, if they're not too smart, maybe it would just um, be kind of a wake-up call to um, the world to, to focus more on safety. If they are smarter, then you might get some unintended consequences, like AIs with values that you don't agree with that take over. So, yeah, all of them have a lot of possibilities. I think unsafe AI is not necessarily uh, very likely. Um, but maybe not, maybe not unlikely either. Okay. But yeah, I guess um, the, the main point about the arms race scenario is that um, there might be more speed pressure, more pressure to develop first, so it's more likely you'd make mistakes or or just not even consider moral, moral values in general, even if you don't make um, technical mistakes. So do you think that um, some uh, international negotiations should be initiated as soon as possible? Um, pr- probably it would be good to have some international organization that, that works on like even just narrow AI right now because I think um, if you tried to focus on general AI, people would laugh at you for the most part because it, it is many decades away. But like if you started some international AI um, agency or whatever, and then uh, then that could naturally evolve as the technology becomes more powerful. Like, yeah, it, it, it's, it's probably, probably you'd need people like us or, you know, um, academics to focus on the long-term scenarios at the moment because they're more speculative and um, mm-hmm. harder to get uh, taken seriously. Yeah, so mm-hmm. so in general, I would push for more either research, like both research and um, popularization. Although maybe there are downsides to the popularization, as we talked about. One is the possibility of sparking arms races. Another is the possibility that the public gets um, scared and does uh, irrational things. Um, it's hard to say what the what the impact would be if the public got scared of AI in the same way that it's scared of Ebola or terrorism or things like that. Um, well, maybe. It, yeah, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, it could lead to irrational policies or it could lead to good good stuff, so I'm not really sure what would happen. And it's kind of interesting it hasn't happened. I think part of it might be because, well, part of it's just because it's very weird and not different from our normal experience, but it might also partly be because science fiction makes it look like it's just fiction, because almost everybody knows about AI is taking over the world um, from movies and books. So so it's interesting that they haven't uh, taken it more seriously. Mm-hmm. How would you, uh, what do you think would motivate countries to engage in such preventive negotiations or into building an international agency for artificial intelligence? I would guess a lot of it would be domestic pressure because um, ultimately countries are motivated by staying in power. I mean, people in power are motivated by staying in power. And so that can mean their country staying in power relative to the rest of the world, but it can also mean their administration staying in power relative to their their electorate. And there's some evidence that that uh, popular pressure in the 80s changed Reagan's stance on the Cold War significantly. He went from being very pro-nukes to wanting to push for disarmament. And the most significant disarmament treaty happened in his administration. So yeah, so, yeah, I think, I think, I think a, lot a lot of these things do come from domestic, domestic pressures. pressures. And we've and seen that even historically, like nationalism leading to warfare and things like that. And uh, I, guess, I guess like cultural, like cultural values, values could matter a little bit too, although like, like, you know, the fact that, the, fact that uh, the, the leaders grew up with certain values, values might lead them to follow those mm-hmm. values at least somewhat when they're in power. So I mean, like changing um, popular opinions could, can help both because it changes what what the public demands, and also because the leaders come from a country where those values exist. So, like popularization would be very useful in that case. 
Yeah, yeah. It, 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 in, some in some ways, ways it's, it's hard to say if it's the most leveraged strategy because there are lots of people who want to push for world peace and things like that. So it's like not a not a rare um, thing to work on. There are um, countless authors and musicians and everybody who um, try to um, promote those kinds of values. So so I'm not sh- saying that's the best approach necessarily, but like in aggregate, it's possible that could have a, a significant impact. I mean, what mm-hmm. the public thinks. Also, like reducing xenophobia and nationalism. Yeah, just having more um, willingness to cooperate. And uh, it seems like a lot of conflicts are, are driven by nationalism at the moment. Beyond that, uh, trying to change the dynamics could help too, if that's possible, because... So, to some extent, um, the outcomes are driven by um, game theory, or even if not formal game theory, by informal dynamics mm-hmm. of the system. So the first approach is sort of like in game theory, you change the payoffs. That is like um, if, if you change your values, then you change the payoffs of a given action. The second mm-hmm. approach is to find different, um, to change the game itself and change the dynamics of the game to make better equilibria become optimal. So, for example, if you've got better international institutions that make cooperation possible, then that can change the dynamics such that cooperation becomes a better option than than trying to win the arms race. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, what do you think could be the reasons for states uh, not to engage in uh, international negotiations? Well, the, historically, in nuclear weapons, it has been, well, I guess two things. One is fear of defection, um, because it can be hard to verify and even harder to verify AI compliance and, um, not wanting to, not wanting to not be the world's leader. The, the U.S. in particular would probably have a hard time with this because a lot of people want the U.S. to retain its status as the most powerful country in the world and, uh, they, resist um, even like joining the UN on certain initiatives because it reduces <laughs> national autonomy and things like that. Yeah, it, it does seem like compliance would be a very hard thing in the case of AI, depending on the size required. I mean, it's possible that general AI would require very big computing clusters and things, um, but like developing the algorithms, at least in test cases, could be done more locally and um and there are, I mean, like companies do have massive computing clusters for ordinary operations, so it's very hard to tell what's going on. Um, you can't, like, look at a computer and see what's running on it. So, yeah, it seems like compliance is maybe the hardest part. Um, and then the, the national pride thing. And then I guess third is the pressures, the economic pressures to um, go as fast as you can because you want to make as much money as you can slash get the benefits. Like, like people might people say might you're say you're denying uh, us medical advances or whatever good things would come from more AI. Mm-hmm. So the last thing I would say is, especially from the suffering reduction perspective, and I kind of said this at the beginning too, uh, that um, I think we should also think more about um, what what AI outcomes we want and don't want, um, because um, just humans controlling AIs is uh, makes sense if you, I mean, like. It, it, there are scenarios under which um, AIs with goals other than humans could do some good things too. I mean, they would actually um, have their own values and and um, mm-hmm. do things differently than people. But like, we should think more about how valuable um, an uncontrolled AI's actions would be. Also, mm-hmm. um, so so one of my top priorities for the Foundational Research Institute (FRI) is to think about what kinds of suffering would result from both um, controlled and uncontrolled AI. Because I think there are some cases where controlled AI could result in more suffering, other cases where it would result in less suffering. Mm-hmm. So um, thinking more about that rather than just kind of going with the gut impulse to keep yourself safe from being taken over um, would help. So expanding the discussion to more communities with more viewpoints could, could be good in that regard. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you so much.